right, so, all right, boom. What up? It's 92.9 WDUP, New London's home of Titans, hip hop, and RB. It's your boy, Mike Mitch Ill. Special guest online. It's not his first time with his uh, great Kading. Murder rap. Unsolved. He's been out here active. And, um, you know, he's gracious enough to uh, actually tap back in with us, man. Thanks for calling in, Greg. Absolutely, buddy. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. Yeah, so, you know, you know, Greg, I'm not trying to attack you, but, you know, over the years, I kind of had some discrepancies that I saw, and I, you know, mm-hmm. want to actually get into it right now, you know. What's your what's your response to the dossier? Because, of, co- of course, like, you know, it's a dissenting view for you. You know, it's kind of exactly different in, like, you know, all the um, evidence you got kind of just proved that in your eyes, but they have value opinions, too. What's mm-hmm. your thoughts on the dossier? Well, everybody's entitled to their opinions. Um, I think that you need to be very, very careful when your opinions turn into conclusions, which then falsely, um, falsely allege that people commit crimes. You know, people need to be protected from false accusations as much as we need to pursue those people that have actually committed crimes. So that's why I take issue with it. Yeah. The individuals that they point fingers at are demonstrably innocent of these claims that are being made. And so that's where I have issue with it. I understand that they have their beliefs, their opinions, their facts. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that uh, it, it's easy to illustrate how wrong they are. And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to do my own podcast in response to that. And we're going to really set it up and show where the holes are in their theories. Okay. So let's talk about the back and forth. Um, the dossier claimed that they reached out to you for interview or back and forth debate and you decline we, i mean our, 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 our back and forth you say like you're with it you know what i mean can you just spell that yeah so there's some truth to that it's not exactly the way that they're presenting it i said that i'm open to have the debate but i wanted it to be on neutral ground obviously there are people that have already formed conclusions and so i don't think that they're in the best position to be objective about the conversation. They've already made their minds up. They're presenting these things as truths. And that's not the best place to have a fair debate. Okay. And so I said, hey, I'm happy to have the conversation. I'll have the debate. We just need to do it on neutral grounds because they are now in control of editing it to fit their narrative. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm just not, I'm not going to fall into that type of trap. I hear that. So do you think it's a conflict of interest? Like you kind of been on Reggie Rice's po- uh, podcast or his platform with uh, uh, Bond First and they, you know, they're rolling it, you know? It's just like, mm-hmm. is that conflict of interest at all? Because it kind of look crazy on the outside looking in, bro. Uh, no, I don't think it's a conflict of interest. I have no affiliation with Bomb First other than I happen to know um, Highland, who I think is the producer behind Bomb First. Um, I happen to know him and have been a guest on their show, just like I've been a guest on the Gangster Chronicle, just like I've been a guest on a hundred different um, interviews. Yeah. I open myself up to the conversation if they want to have it. But if they're already adversarial to me, yeah. then really what do I have to gain mm-hmm. by going into an arena where the where it's not going to be a, a a level playing field, so to speak? I hear that, but you know, on the outside looking in, it kind of looked like you and Reggie Wright got a report of some sort. Am I wrong on that? No, you're not wrong with that. Um, I do have a rapport with Reggie Wright. Um, I defend him against the allegations that are made that I know to be untrue. Just like I would defend you if I knew you and had information to prove your innocence, I would defend you, okay. regardless of what those haters against you might say. And that's all it is. I don't have any allegiance to Reggie Wright. I don't have any financial connection to him. I don't have anything other than I know him to be true of the charges that people are saying. And therefore, I defend him as I would anybody else. Okay, for, for our side of the camp, how did that uh, relationship, if you want to call it a relationship, just how did that you know connection develop between you and Reggie to begin with? Okay, so I never, I've never met Reggie in my life until I think 2008. So mm-hmm. we are already several years into the investigation. And of course, Reggie Wright, I had already seen all the interviews that he conducted, both with the FBI and with the LAPD and with the Sheriff's Department. There was a long history of interviews with Reggie Wright. Yes. And so I was privy to all of that information. I know what he had said. I know what he didn't say. And so at some point in time, we just went and said, hey, we'd like to continue to ask you some questions. We built a rapport as we would with anybody that we want to interview. And we then began to unravel some of the things that 
he thought might lead us down the right road. Okay, so uh, the Murder Rag documentary, check it out. It's still, like, whether you believe it or not, it's still a great watch, you know, and it's very, you know, inform um, you know informational and everything like that. But where did the whole Poochie theory come in? Come in the, it kind of, of seemed like it came from Reggie at Death Row Camp. And I don't know, it, could that be a red herring at all? Well, you know, it, you, know, you, know you, you, you allow yourself all of these options. You don't go into it and just commit yourself to a theory until you've had a chance to look into it, investigate it, explore it, and do all of those things, and then hopefully substantiate it. And so with Poochie, his name had come up early on in the investigation. His name was on paperwork from the very beginning. So it wasn't anything new. It wasn't Reggie told us about Poochie. He was already in. You know, we knew that Poochie had been involved in other murders. He was wanted at another time for another murder. So he was always a person that we were aware of. He was just not a suspect in the murder until we started to explore the possibility of him being a suspect in the murder. And that came at the time when um, I think Roderick Reed was the first one to send a letter to a guy named Kevin Hackey. Yeah. And in that letter, it mentions Poochie. Mm -hmm. And Roderick Reed from prison is saying, hey, he knows Poochie killed Biggie. So we had that information early on in the case. So we then began to develop that lead and see where it went. And of course, Reggie enters the picture, with, picture when we interview him. Reggie doesn't really tell us so much about Poochie. He just leads us into a direction where we meet a female who then substantiates some of the things that could have, uh, we believe could have been true. Okay. So I'm gonna push back on this. All right, so Psycho Mike, you know, during your documentary, you kind of questioned his credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, excuse me. And um, uh, you had disgraced Kevin Hackey, and then you had somebody in jail, Roger mm -hmm. Reed, trying to get out, and maybe he's trying to like trying to find an angle to get out. Like, how do you discern who's more credible? Well, you have to you have to look at it from all different angles. You have to find out what their motives might be. You have to find out, you know, the history of their credibility. You have to find out, you know, all these things. You look at them all individually and weigh them and evaluate whether or not this particular thing is credible. Now, Psycho Mike, as you know, came on early in the investigation. He provided a bunch of information about this supposed shooter that is, is, is relatively well detailed. And none of that information that he provides is consistent with what was known about Harry Billups or Amir Muhammad. Let me finish real quick. So Michael Robinson, he enters the picture. He's got a history of psychological problems. He's on medications. I'm very good friends with his handler from the FBI. And we've talked all this out. And we looked at it all back at the time that we were ask, asking these questions. So Michael Robinson uh, provides these in, this, this one name, A-M-I-R. That's the only thing that is connected to this person who then becomes Amir Mohammed Harry Billups. That's it. Everything else he tells us about the suspects, you can prove discredits him. So I don't discredit anybody, they discredit themselves. Hey, but talk about Psycho Mike, you kind of reference back to his testimony to put you on Keefe D's trail. Am I wrong on that? Yes, you're wrong on that. I am, all right, all right. And please uh, set, set the record straight for me then. No, Keefe D was always a person of interest because we knew who his nephew was. Mm -hmm. Keefe D was always, we knew, A, in Las Vegas, B, the uncle of Orlando Anderson, who is the primary suspect in the Tupac murder. So we knew about Keefe D way before. Uh, I don't think anything with Cycle Mike had anything to do with Keefe D, other than when he's giving this description of this supposed shooter, mm -hmm. he says it's Ishmael or... Amir or Abraham or some Middle Eastern name or maybe it's Kenny or Kiki. So he provides five different names um, as he's trying to identify this, per this particular individual who he claims is the shooter, which is all hearsay information to begin with because Michael Robinson's in jail at the time and he's just saying he's getting this information from, you know, the stratosphere, from people on the outside. But then you said, so then you said it's like Mike to Amir's house. Like, why would you even do that if like his whole testimony is trash? Why would I do that? I wouldn't. Now, were you behind that? Like, like on your documentary, you mentioned that he was sent to Amir's house and he looked at him like, I'm a real estate agent. And, he, and you know, they, they uh, had that no. awkward exchange. Who was behind that? Phil Carson. It was Phil Carson? That was okay. him. Phil Carson took him down there in the FBI and it was this complete debacle of an investigation. The whole thing turned into a shit show. 
and the local police department had to get involved because Amir Mohammed's like, who's this MF at my front door? Yeah. So he calls the police on this guy who's jumping in and out of bushes and doing all this crazy shit, pardon my language. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that we had nothing to do with that. At that point in time, the LAPD was sitting back just watching how this thing goes. Yeah. I hear that. So, you know what? I'm going to pivot a different direction. Poochie, right? He was never placed at the scene. And you said he's known for being a shooter, being a hitman. When has mm -hmm. he ever, you know, dressed in a bow tie and a suit and all that to take somebody out? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you know, I've had that conversation with people that were associated with Mob Pyro, even members of the Mob Pyro. And we also had uh, police reports documenting yeah. that guys were dressing up in, in the NOI attire and going out and doing crimes, in, in particular like home invasion robberies. Now, if you understand the gang culture and the history of gangs, it wasn't un, uh, un, unusual for them to present, pretend to be something else. Like some bloods would do a drive-by. Now they say drive-by, doing a drive-by, they'll yell out Crips or throw Crip signs in order to give, the pe you know, to give the false impression of who it really was. This was also happening with people that were pretending to be uh, Fruit of Islam. Mm -hmm. And they were doing home invasion robberies. And so we were like, okay, well, we already know that there's guys from Compton, from the Pyro sets that are doing this type of thing already. Yep. And then we had some other information about Pucci where he was potentially dressing up as another individual in order to give the impression that it wasn't him. So it wasn't completely out of character, mm -hmm. not only within the, the group of people that he would have been associated with, but for him himself. He was a smart guy, relatively smart guy. Okay. So Biggie was out in L.A. for like maybe a month, maybe even two. You know, why wait until the most star-studded event, cops everywhere, to actually pull off this hit? You know what I'm saying? You could have got Mace, a, a bad boy artist, was at a, a basketball charity event, and he was all there. He was good money. And then, and, and then like, you know, everybody knew Big was in town. Why wait until that point at the Peterson? where there could be cops all over the place. There's cameras, there's million dollar cars everywhere. And that's when you're doing the shot? You know, he's mm -hmm. you know, playing your uh, perspective on that. Well, you've got you've to apply that question to every single shooter. Who would do that? And, you know, who would be so brazen? Doesn't matter if it's Pucci or David Mack or anybody. You know, you, you still got to ask that same question. Why would anybody do it here and now? Well, our answer to that is because that's when there was a known opportunity. That's when Suge Knight would have known, or at least had a very good reason to believe that Biggie was going to be there. And what kind of compounds that is that at the hotels and stuff where Biggie was staying, there were people that were going to be aware of Biggie's whereabouts, aware of what his kind of itinerary might be. And that could have been the opportunity to set this up at that particular time and place. Pucci was a, you know, Pucci was hard and, you know, down for the cause. I don't think he was overly worried about, um, you know, you know, getting caught. He's it's not, it's not like Pucci, like some mastermind, like hitman or something like that. You know what I'm saying? That's the way, the, you know, the narrative there's, being painted. There's nothing, ma dude, this was a gang hit. This is no different than what happened to Tupac in Las Vegas. It was almost identical. This was not a sophisticated type of thing. This is a typical drive-by shooting that takes place in the hood all the time. It just happened to be at a place where there was a lot more people. But as you know, and as I know, yeah. even with that amount of people, nobody really saw a thing. Okay, so great. Like, you, you know, you, you've been in law enforcement for a minute and you studied everything, you're an investigator, and I'm not saying you're not good at what you do. But mm -hmm. if you're a gangbanger, you're going to take the shot where it's a whole bunch of witnesses, or you're going to take a shot with Biggie's uh, uh, leaving the hotel, going to a CBS or something like that. You know what I'm saying? You're going to throw a trail on him and figure out where he's going. You know what I'm saying? You're going to do it on prime real estate? I mean, so I mean now you're, no, no. So and now even if you believe that, I'm sorry, Greg, I'm sorry, Greg. Even if you believe that, I'm just saying, like, is that, like, the, the best way to go about taking out somebody? I don't know. I can tell you from my experiences, I've seen drive-by shootings in front, in front of our police station. Okay. So, you know, it's not, you're, you're putting too much into this, in my opinion. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a crowded place. Yes, uh, the opportunity presented itself and it was taken. Uh, we don't know whether there was other opportunities. We don't know yeah. what Pucci knew, um, but we have to go with the information that we know to, that we have, 
And that's that he was shot and killed in front of the Peterson Auto Museum. And you can apply the question to whoever the shooter might have been. It's still the same thing. Well, who would have done this? Who would have been so crazy? Well, clearly anybody because somebody did it. Okay. Have you ever, uh, just uh, from a due diligence standpoint, have you ever interviewed David Mack, Rafael Perez, Mayor Muhammad? Just due diligence. Even if you ain't believe they were behind it, just mm -hmm. for due diligence sake. Have you ever interviewed them? Well, keep in mind that as when I come on to the investigation, those things have already taken place, right? Okay. So these interviews have already taken place. Uh, mm -hmm. Rafael Perez had been interviewed numerous times. Mac was interviewed numerous times. I attempted to get a hold of Mac. I didn't get a response. I did talk to Rafael Perez, had a sit down with him, and I've interviewed Amir Mohammed several times. Okay. And in, in, in addition to all of the interviews that Amir Mohammed had already done prior to me getting involved in the case. Mm -hmm. So all of those things were done. There was due diligence. And, and the police were satisfied that Omar Mohammed had absolutely nothing to do with the murder. All right, Amir Mohammed, I'm not trying to attack the man, but I mean, prior, excuse me, no, afterwards, I could be wrong, you know, you know, fake news everywhere, but they say that, you know, he had a violent history after the Biggie thing, like with his wife and, you know, brandishing guns and everything like that. All right, he probably needed some real estate agent or something like that, but he had a history mm -hmm. of violence too. Well, if you if if you've had a, a spout with your wife and there's a Prince crime gun? report, no, I'm, I'm I'm just let me explain. Okay? Uh, let me tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. So his he his he get his, he's jealous. He's got this girlfriend who's seen another guy, mm -hmm. and he gets enraged by it. And there's some kind of conflict going on between him and this guy. That guy claims that he had a gun, right, mm -hmm. on the freeway as they're driving by each other. Amir claims that, no, it was in the trunk because I was in the middle of moving. I didn't have a gun in, uh, uh, accessible to me. So you got two sides of the story. And all we know is that no charges were filed. And so this was a particular thing that was motivated by jealousy. And that's really the extent of his criminal history. But because a person has some kind of conflict like that in their life, you can't then assume, well, he's a violent individual and therefore capable of murder. Okay, that's the with Murder Rap the, uh, documentary. Again, it's a great documentary. You know, I feel like a majority of the documentary was devoted to pop. Like you had KVD and his team every step of the way. I feel like you devoted the last fifteen minutes to actually precise, precisely giving out. You know, what I mean, the, the rundown of what happened to Biggie, and you were on the Biggie case, not the Tupac case. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like you devoted more time to the pop case, even though it's both connected. I feel like you had more info for the pot than Biggie. You no, know, what's okay. your response to that? Well, I, I, I wouldn't agree that more time was devoted, but I would definitely agree that we were deeply interested in solving Tupac's case because we did believe it was connected. And mm -hmm. so therefore, because of that presumption or that uh, um, you know, perspective, of course, we're going to devote some time and energy into it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is what it is. You know, fortunately, we we're in a situation to wrangle up Keefe D, who explained what their role was in Tupac's murder. And then, of course, we get Teresa Swan and she, you know, put her in a position where she's going to explain her, her um, involvement in Biggie's murder. And so it's just a matter of, hey, we don't get to dictate where the leads take us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, talking about Teresa Swan, I... I'm not going to be emotional. I'm not going to say a real name. Teresa, so I'm, I'm going to stick with that. Why well, protect her identity but not Keefe D? They've both been on the proper agreement. Why well, protect her but not Keefe D? And then on top of that, before you go, Craig, you're giving, you're giving out this info. She'll go automatically know who's giving out this info. And like, all right, she got, like, lawyer privilege to go in there and this went down, this went down. Like, if Suge is a smart man, he's like, all right, that's, you know what I mean, Teresa Swan. Automatically like, that. Right. No, please explain that for me, man. Explain which which component. I mean, why we expose Keefe? Now, yeah, why, why 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 are you why yeah why why are you exposing uh Keefe D? And now, all right, you could be like all right, Keefe D, some hood dude, he can handle himself. But sometimes, mm -hmm. like as human beings, we could uh protect somebody from themselves. We should do that. But all right, you you are like hiding the name of somebody who was a part of the Biggie Small assassination. You know what I'm saying? Like why the, mm -hmm. why does she get protected but not Keefe? D? Mm hmm. Uh, so that was a collective decision that we all made, um, all the investigators involved at the time. 
And then also, you've got to understand, when before I exposed Keefe, I went and I met with him. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, Keefe, man, I'm, I'm going to put a book out there. I'm going to name your name. And his response was, I don't give a fuck. Bring it. Yeah. You know, so essentially, if Keefe D is saying he doesn't have an issue with it, and I want to put out as much information as I can, mm -hmm. and I don't have so much problem exposing a guy who's very brazen and kind of like um, – proud about what he's done mm -hmm. goes out ex, you know uh, uh, confesses to this thing in multiple different ways he's on his own he's created his own situation i don't have a problem putting his name out there with Teresa swan it's a little different thing right she's a female she's not really from the street she's not gangster like that she's got kids and we are going to do what we can to explain what happened while at the same time taking some responsibility and protecting her from anybody that might want to retaliate against her. I understand what you're saying, but I do see these as two different people who can handle things differently. And so, you know, people that know Teresa know who we're talking about. Yeah. Well, okay, okay. But can I make the equivalent like like a basketball coach? Somebody uh rose an ankle, person knee. It's like, yo, let me protect you from yourself. Okay, I know you're hearing yourself. I know you can go out there with a, a bum knee and still got, drop 20. You, you, you know what I'm saying? You still divulge his name. You know what I mean? You being law enforcement, do you think that's kind of a misstep right there? You know what I mean? Because, like, on, on no, the outside no. looking in, it kind of looks look like an issue as far as concerning credibility and everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, you protect well, KBD, who, all right, all right, boom, that's death row. He took care of Pac, allegedly. You know what I'm saying? But, like, all right, the biggest side, are you protecting the person who actually or helped orchestrate the killing of Biggie Smalls? It looked kind of so, crazy, Greg. Yeah. So, well, it is evidently it, it is crazy for you. I've never had anybody else come to me and say that they thought it was crazy, but I understand this is your perception of the whole thing. So let me ask you this question before I answer that. Are you more, are you more uh, upset that I put his name out there or are you more upset that I didn't put her name out there? First off, she's behind the orchestration of him getting killed. Well, wait, no, 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 I'm not about to answer, Greg. No, like, like, to answer your question, I'm not one, uh, upset one way or the other. I just want to even plan still. All right, you expose Keefe D, but you don't expose who, who orchestrated the hit. Whether she's the money woman, the in-between, she was a co-conspirator to uh, Biggie getting murdered. So, yes, I want her exposed. If you're going to expose Keefe D, expose her too. You're in law enforcement, aren't you? You know what I'm saying? Like, aren't you supposed to expose people? Like, you're not supposed to take lies or being talking in code and nothing like that. You're in law enforcement. You're supposed to... You know what I mean? Solve the murder, you're supposed to be part of the task force, so. Okay. I never, well, first of all, you keep saying I'm in law enforcement. I wasn't at the time this all happened. No, nah, but you right? were so, investigated. But not, yeah, but you're saying you're in law enforcement and you did this. So these are important little distinctions. I was retired. I had no obligation to the department. I had no obligation to anything. I get to decide what I want to do. And yes, I was prior law enforcement at the time that we discovered this information. I then retire and I write a book. I decide that I'm going to put Keefe's name in that book because I think it's really important to put as much truth out there as you can. But at the same time, I and others who, after a conversation, decided let's not put Teresa Swan's real name out there. Okay. And so that was the decision was made. I'm sorry if it doesn't sit well with you, but that was a decision that was made and I will continue to stand by it. So what was the deciding factor because she's a woman? Uh, it was, that's one of the components. Yes, okay. that's one of the considerations, that she's a woman, she has young children at home, mm -hmm. and we just thought that it was in the best interest. Um, oh, and also to add to this, when I was publishing the book, Random House was also demanding that we put her name as an alias. So when I was getting going through the publishing mm -hmm. process, the legal perspective by Random House was to give her an alias. So that was another consideration um, in, 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 you know, in um, um, getting the book done. So those, those all, all those things played a role in the decision. Okay, I get it. I mean, do you feel like a sense of compassion for her? Cause she, I mean, at the end of the day, she helped orchestrate a murder, another human being. Like forget he a rapper. Like, do you feel like a sense of compassion for her because she's a woman? No. Why is she getting super like, you know, a super pass but then, all right, Keefe D, you throw him out there to the wolves. You know what I'm saying? Even though, all right, you think he's good. Keefe D put himself out to the wolves. 
I didn't have to do anything. Keefe D is absolutely, he's out on the front line saying, I'm involved in, in Pox murder, come yeah. get me, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't hear a word from her. She don't want nothing to do with this exposure. She ain't riding on it. Big difference. I mean, all right. Your interaction, put, yourself, put aside your interaction with her. You know, do you think she should be held accountable at all? Or just like, kind of brush it off, like, I think that that you, I, no, I don't. I think everybody should be held accountable. And that's one of the issues that I have with this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, my, my position on this, Mike, is that if these people aren't going to be held accountable in court, right, then the public still should have the opportunity to get the information in order to form conclusions to kind of judge it for themselves. And that's where we're at, unfortunately. Nobody's ever going to jail behind either of these murders. Um, yes, uh, I, I don't have any kind of, I'm not protecting her in the sense that I'm keeping her from being charged. I wanted to see people charged, Yeah, but I don't get to make all those decisions. Okay, so with the dossier, even though we have like different views on it, um, you know, if both sides are truly into it to like, you know, solve the murder, why can't y'all link up? All right, you might have disagreements, have conversations and, you know, build from there. Mm -hmm. Why I gotta be, it feel like East versus West right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, Ray Caden versus, you know, the dossier. You know what I'm saying? Phil Carson, Gene Dill versus, uh, you know, it feel like a, a whole recycle of the East versus West thing. If everybody's like really into actually solving this thing right here, why can't y'all just link up, put y'all uh, disagreements aside and actually feel? I think, I think because ultimately some people dig their heels in and uh, we're, we're never going to agree probably on what the truth is. They have their opinions based on the information, the way that they've interpreted that information and the way they're presenting that information. I, on the other hand, am taking all the investigative material that we found out in the case and saying this was where everything led us. This was the conclusions that we collectively drew. But keep in mind, this isn't great hating. This was our entire task force, including the FBI and several different members of the FBI. We all formed these conclusions. The FBI was along with us for the entire ride. And so, you know, if I'm not going to change my opinion unless some better piece of evidence comes forward that can disprove the claims that I'm making. And I've never seen that. And I don't believe it'll ever be seen because I absolutely think we got to the truth. Do you feel like you got to stick to your guns because you had the murder rap and you had Unsolved, which was a great show, you know, a great uh, show in U uh, USA? Do you feel like you got to stick to your guns because it might hurt your credibility because you put all this content out and now, you know, maybe some new info come up and it might disprove it? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see if that happens. If if factual information comes out, it's that you, like actual evidence comes out, mm -hmm. I've got to accept that. I don't think it's going to happen because I think we've already got that. Okay. However, if it comes out, it is what it is. And I think that this is the problem that they've had. For instance, with Russell Poole, you know, he was not, you know, he had his nine months on the job um, investigating Biggie. He was then transferred. He then retires prematurely and he goes off onto his second career, right? So he's detached from the whole thing. Now he's an outsider looking in. He doesn't get to be privy to any of the information that's being developed as the investigation continues to go on. So we conduct our investigation. Of course, it's years later and we have all this new information too, by the way. And uh, I go, I, I tell Russ through a mutual uh, contact. I'm like, hey man, let's sit down. Let me show you what we got mm -hmm. so that you can be prepared to either change your opinion or at least you know what we have. He wouldn't. He wouldn't meet with me. He wouldn't have a conversation with me. All he did at that time was begin to try to uh, mischaracterize me instead of being honest with himself and saying, okay, let me at least go sit down with this man, see what they've got and see whether or not their information, their evidence is stronger than what I have been presenting. And he didn't do it. Okay. If Miss Wallace didn't do the civil suit for 500 million, whatever the number was, that could mm -hmm. potentially bankrupt the LAPD, would it be solved? Because it felt feel like, all right, you could bankrupt the whole city, all right, yeah, we got to cover it up. And, and talk about Stephen Katz. I don't know if you talk about Stephen Katz during your podcast. I mean, I'm, not your podcast, your documentary. You know, they talk about he was hiding documents and everything like that. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. None of that's true. It's it's the way that people have been presenting that um, event or presenting that 
side of the story, but no, I know Steve Katz um, well, worked with him. He's a good guy. He's a good man. Doesn't deserve the bullshit that's being thrown his way. Um, Steve Katz, in every investigation, let me tell you this, Mike, in every investigation, there's mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, more often than not, 99% of the time, they're unintentional, but there's no such thing as a perfect investigation. There just isn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's oversight. There's, you know, sometimes we, we make mistakes. Steve Katz didn't actually do anything wrong. The tape that was found in his, in his uh, desk drawer, it had a tracking number on it. That tracking number is then attached to all the discovery. So the, 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 he wasn't hiding anything. The discovery had already been turned over, including the um, number of that tape and also the name of the person that was, uh, that was um, interviewed on that tape. Nothing was hidden, but through the lawyer theatrics and manipulation, the Wallace uh, attorney said, hey, let's present this as them trying to hide evidence, which is what they did. They came in and said, look at this horrible thing. We had to go find this thing and they're trying to suppress information. Well, none of that was true. And that then got exposed in court that it wasn't true. Here, this is important, Mike. Yeah. It was then shown in court that none of those things happened. But you know who's not going out there and going, hey, by the way, Steve Katz didn't do anything wrong? is the people that know that if they then do that, it undermines their whole narrative. Steve Katz is not a corrupt guy. He's not trying to hide anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back to Tammy. All right, so like you jammed up on fraud charges, right? And then you're like, oh, you, you floated, oh, you can lose your kids and all that. Let's be, let's be real. If she had a good lawyer, that's a slap on the wrist, bro. You think she gonna really admit to being, you know what I mean, complicit to murder? That's how I look on the outside looking in, bro. Well, she did. Okay. All right, we keep at that day. But you know what I'm saying? On the outside looking in, it's like, all right, she's facing a slap on the wrist, but she going to fess up to something that's, I don't, it, I don't know it, what get worse than uh, murder and terrorism. You know what Mike, I'm saying? Like, are you a, Mike, are you a father? No, I'm not. I can understand if what were, If you were, then maybe you would probably be a little bit more understanding of her predicament. If you're a mother... Yeah, I know. I see you shaking your head. But no, I was finished. I got it. Got it. You got it, Greg. Yeah. If you're a mother mm -hmm. and you think that possibly your kids are going to be taken from you, and you, you know, she's got a long history of perjury and criminal activity. She knows she doesn't know how this is going to work out. She doesn't know if it's going to be a slap on the wrist or 18 months in prison. Mm -hmm. So when she sees that there's a possibility that she could lose her kids, custody of her kids. That's something that I think any parent would seriously have to look and go, okay, what am I willing to, what am I willing to do to try to protect my kids? Okay. And again, I'm not trying to paint you as a naive detective. I'm sure you agree with what you do, Greg. I'm not trying to insult you. But okay, as soon as you approach it with that, again, facing fraud and you're trying to throw a murder on her, you don't think she went right back to Sugar and you're like, yo, and Sugar might have looked at it like, yo, this is BS, yo, just give them what they want. No. You, you, you get the, you know what I mean, the queen for the day, you know what I'm saying? No, uh, like, all right, you put this, uh, uh, the, the murder on a dead person, there's no no harm, no fair. I think mm -hmm. that's what I would do if I'm sure. And you, hey, hey Greg, you got to know she went back with sugar as soon as you uh, talk to y'all. Well, if she, we have no reason to believe she did. She continued to have conversations, continued to work on behalf of the FBI, continued to work the case with them in conjunction with them. Um, you know, this was a slow developing process. We sat down on multiple occasions mm -hmm. and we got to the point where we don't get to decide what she tells us. We just have to take what she tells us and evaluate whether we think it's true or not and try to corroborate it. And that's exactly yeah. what we did. Okay. You know, we don't get to dictate all of these terms and conditions. If she decides that she wants to tell us a story and, uh, and then we have to decide whether we believe it's true or not. And we just happen to all believe it's true because we corroborated so many different aspects of it. Okay. Um, do you feel a way about uh, Miss Wallace co-signing and actually being in the city of Lass? Because, you know, that's the movie that kind of contradicts your theory. Yeah. So here's the thing. I, 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 I'm never going to question what Miss Wallace does. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a right to do anything that she wants. And even more than a right, I think that it's unfair 
um, considering all that she's been through, mm -hmm. for her to not really know what you know, the ultimate truth is. She's shown support for my theory. Uh, clearly, she's in this movie, so you can say that there's at least indirect or tacit report for that theory. Mm -hmm. She's the woman who has to figure out this now on her own. We've given her what we believe to be true. She's shown support for that. But now there's this other thing that cost her millions of dollars and years of her life pursuing this thing that all fell apart. And if she wants to continue to promote that, then so be it. I don't judge her. I have all the respect in the world for her. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me how I feel about it, I say, let the woman do what the woman wants to do. But it doesn't change my opinion in any way, shape or form as to what happened. Craig, uh, excuse me, uh, Gene Dill, he actually uh, made it, and then we heard it. I, you might have mentioned it um, during your documentary as well. Uh, Puff had a run-in with the FOI, the Fruits of Islam. And, you know, the guy who supposedly took out Big was wearing a bow tie. Have you mm -hmm. ever, ever, like, you know what I mean, investigated the FOI at all? That angle? Absolutely, yeah. They were always something that we were looking into with an open mind during the investigation. We had people from our anti-terrorist division they're the ones who monitor like domestic terrorism and that type of stuff. And of course, they were at certain points in history looking at uh, possibility of, you know, extreme Islamic groups and that type of thing. And of mm -hmm. course, we were like, hey, do you have any information? So we're working in conjunction with different groups that investigate different groups of people and keeping in mind. Yeah, there was definitely this NOI component of the surrounding environment of Big East shooting. We know that they were doing a lot of the hotel security at the hotels. We know that there was this confrontation prior at the award show. And so they were always people that were in our heads as like, maybe there's something there. So we never discounted that. Okay. Was there anything that kind of looked kind of fishy? Like looking back, it's like, all right, maybe we should have went this angle. Like, did you see anything that kind of could lead to something? From that angle? Well, well, of course, but you now here's the thing, Mike, and this is important, but before we go out and start to air that stuff publicly, we have to have facts. We have to know that what we're going to say doesn't falsely accuse people. Yeah. And so we can't just come out and go, yeah, the Nation of Islam was, you know, involved because there's this circumstantial information that shows they were around. Mm -hmm. Well, they were around, so therefore they might, no, we can't do that. That's irresponsible and unfair to them. Now, if we had evidence proving that they were involved, then I'd be the first one going, look, here's the evidence. Okay. So, Greg, uh, thanks for, um, you know, tapping in with me, man. I'm, it was a great conversation. And, uh, Greg, like, again, I'm not trying to attack you, you know, like, again, I want to thank you again five years ago when the Murder Rap um, documentary dropped. You was gracious enough to give us an interview, and we was like a, a young radio station, FM radio station coming out of nowhere, and, um, you know, we've been around for a while now, and thank you for doing this, asking questions. And is there any way, like, because, all right, you was put on the Biggie Small case to solve it. You know, the guys, mm -hmm. they, they have their view. Like, mm -hmm. what would it take for you guys to actually squash and actually, you know, line, you know? And I know, like, all right, you have your set of facts. They have their set of facts. Mm -hmm. It's just like, all right, all right, we can actually discuss facts back and forth without being, you know, at each other's neck. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm not hostile towards anybody. I, I will mm -hmm. confront myths, mistruths. Yeah. You know, I'll be happy to point out where things are being misrepresented. And I'm not, I wouldn't say they're lying. I just think that they are not providing the information and people aren't asking the right questions. That's the most important thing. People don't know any better, so they don't know what questions need to be asked. I listen to that and I have a hundred questions and I'm going to, I'm going to address all these things. I'm going to do my own podcast in response to that. But the difference is I'm going to put on a, you know, on a monitor behind me mm -hmm. and through, through media, we're just going to put everybody's information out there you want to hear what gene deal said the night he was interviewed by lapd versus what he says now well you're going to get to hear that you're going to hear his whole entire interview and what he said back at the time when that's when it's important not years and years later when you have a motive to change things around okay. it's the information that was um, relevant at the time and that is that i think is going to allow the the audience, allow people like yourself to see directly what the truth is um, behind all of these claims. Before I let you go, um, I watched the Gene Deal uh, podcast and I feel like he sticks to his story, but can you help somebody like me? All right, so um, what's the discrepancies that Gene Deal provides? You know, okay, like we'll, just stop, 
Yeah, and again, you, you, it's best to hear his whole interview. He, mm -hmm. he knew that something was happening. He says in the interview, he's like, man, after after you got you got a few unique uh, mecha audio, you know, big, uh, you know, he he he's free now, so I can say, but like he was a big drug king thing. He was out in L.A. and mm -hmm. you know, word on the street is bad boy wasn't safe then, so he relayed message to you know Puff, Big, and all of them, and they didn't heed those warnings. So I I just feel like Gene Deal. You know what, Gene Dill's very, like, you know, he's like, I'm trying to find the right word. Like, you know, he's extra, like, you know, he's very emotional. He's, but I feel like he always, you know what I mean, told the same story. You may feel differently, but I just want to know, like, all right, tell lies, what lies he telling? Okay, so this is important. I'll walk you through it. You know, after Biggie gets shot, Gene's interviewed several times. Um, you know, Gene, of course, he never says he saw the shooter, right? That's important. Never says he saw the shooter. He's not in a position to see the shooter. He's in a car that's already gone through the intersection. Nobody and, walked up on that for the description that Lil C's pointing out of him. That's fine. I'm not discounting that. I'm okay. saying this is an important thing. Mm -hmm. He never saw the shooter, nor does he claim to have seen the shooter. Right? All he knows is there's a description. Well, we already knew NOI people were there. We already knew that there was some kind of beef that carried over from the last night. Right. So is you, if you have a friend that just gets shot and killed, first thing that's going to come to your mind is like, shit, this has to do something with that beef or with this motherfucker over here giving me hard looks. Pardon my language. Um, so, you know, those those are the things that are built into us psychologically. Mm -hmm. And so you start trying to piece it together yourself. And of course, that makes sense for him. The problem is, is this the investigation is unfolding and evidence and information is coming in from all kinds of different sources. That's what the cops have to consider, right? We can't just put special emphasis on Gene Deal. We have to put special emphasis on things that are continuing to corroborate each other. So when we go and, and uh, we were like, okay, yeah, there's a possibility that there's some kind of NOI connection here. We don't know what, we've got this closing, closing thing. Was this actual NOI? Because even Gene himself says, I don't think it was real NOI. Okay. Because it just seemed like it was a person dressed that way, but it didn't seem like a, a real Muslim cat. That's important, right? He, That's he did say that, yeah, he was supposed to address some way. Uh, well, he did say that, yeah. Well, okay. And then after that, of course, we show him some a six pack, and this is early on. We show him a six pack of six different guys, and he points to one and says, "Yeah, this looks this looks like the cat. This looks like the guy. This looks like the guy. Sign here. The guy in the position number two, whatever on this card, is the guy that looked the most like the guy at the night. Well, that guy had nothing to do with nothing." And he certainly didn't look anything like the composites, nor did he look anything like Amir Mohammed. So, G you talk about that deal. picture, the peanut head, and it was like the, the scrambled up picture. Can you talk this about that? Important. This is important. Don't let me finish because this is okay. really important. Yep. Gene picks out a guy as looking, resembling very closely the person that he said that he had, you know, had little issue with in the parking lot, right? Mm -hmm. That person was absolutely not involved in any way, shape, and form. He's a filler photograph in a six-pack. And that guy looks nothing like the composites, and he looks nothing like Amir Mohammed. So later on, when Eugene Deal, years later, after Amir Mohammed's face has already been in, in, in the public, Gene says, no, this is the guy. He's like, wait a minute. He doesn't look anything like the original guy from years ago that you pointed well, out. Pucci don't, so these, Pucci don't look like what, the sketch this, this is what's known as a discrepancy. And in these kind of discrepancies, you then have to try to harmonize what this issue is. And so for you, Mike, if you're an investigator, what do you think the freshest memory is? The one that took place back at the time or the one from years later after you've already been influenced by seeing a person's picture in the newspaper? Now, be honest. No, I, I see both sides of that. Are you influenced? But if you were there, you know what you saw, period. You only need and to see why is he one. picking out a guy that doesn't look anything like the guy that he says later was him? I don't know. Gene, Gene Dill disputed that, you know? And um, I can't point to the video that he disputed that, you know what I'm saying? Just I don't care right now, but he said, like, guys, Again, spoke. and this is what I'm going to do in my podcast, bud. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show oh, you. Well, let me ask you this, though. What is Gene's incentive to lie? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he want to ride on the side of a, a puff car mm -hmm. and, like, check everybody out, see if nobody's pulling out on them. What mm -hmm. is Gene Dill incentive to lie? I'm not saying he's lying. I'm just saying he's wrong. Okay. All right. I got that. Um. All right. Since you dropped the documentary in um, Unsolved, 
have you been exposed to any new info or anything that might kind of pivot your thought process at all? About what are you that comfortable? Like, boom, Poochie did it. It's a done deal. Yeah. So listen, um, I'm continuing. I'm always open ears. And mm -hmm. so I get hit up every day. And there's just no exaggeration. I'm every single day, I'm dealing with some kind of um, person who's just inquiring about something or wanting to ask mm -hmm. questions. Very much like this here. Yeah. But every day I'm dealing with just, and oftentimes I'll get contacted by people who'll be like, hey, man, um, this is what I can tell you. I talked to this cat's uncle, and this is some information I've gathered. So I'm working right now with this guy that I've met through social media who's in a position to kind of provide me more details and information about Poochie. Yeah. So I'm just riding that and allowing that information to unfold and hoping to get more people that I can go and talk to an interview and, and see if we can even further substantiate what we already believe. Okay. Um, so I'm always open to new yeah. information yeah. Um, from, from wherever it comes from. Yeah. Now, great. Thank, thanks again, man. I'm not trying to like attack you. You know, I have like, a, you know, opposite view now from five years ago, you know, again, mm -hmm. five years ago, you didn't have to give it, gave it to us. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for doing this again. And, you know, I had another question. I just forgot. Well, I do have, I, it came back to me right now. I feel like Russell Poole kind of got a bad rap. Like, all right, he got painted as like a, a cook, a cook, you know what I'm saying? Like, K-O-O-K, -K. like he's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Where did that come from? Did that come from your camp? Because I don't know, there's a whole other side that paints him as a decorated, you know what I mean, legit investigator. Like, that's what I'm saying. It kind of feel like two different sides of the coins. They feel like the whole like, crazy Russell Poole thing comes from your camp. Yeah, so I, I, I don't go that far. Listen, I don't know Russell. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm trying to be as respectful as I can because I know he has kids behind that love him and, and want to think the best about their dad's legacy and all of that. So I need to always take that into consideration. And, and I try to, even when I'm being attacked yeah. by those people. <laughs> um, but the thing is this, um, you know, the facts are the facts. You know, Russell had some real issues and those issues probably interfered a little bit with his, with his judgment. Um, you know, he... He had issues at work, uh, professional issues at work. He had personal issues. And, you know, these things all can compound themselves and affect your judgment. And I think that's what happened. I think that he got, a, you know, he got disgruntled. He left the job. I mean, here, Mike, you're six months away from getting a lifetime pension. And you just throw all that up in the air and you throw it away. And, and, and then you continue to have a bunch of financial problems and drinking problems and family problems and work in, in those Wait, things. Where, where does that info come from, though, uh, Greg? Where is that? Like, that's just like just, uh, you know, word on the street? Or like, do you know that for sure? What's he really well, how about, I, how about I give you this? Why don't you go back on Facebook and look at Russell Poole's last post on Facebook where he himself is saying, my life is falling apart. I've lost everything, you know, everything. So he himself is declaring it has spiraled out. Yeah. And so that's not me attacking him. This is me just reiterating something that he himself is declaring. And then, of course, you can look at the records. You can see what's written on paper. You can see the documents. You know, we had to go and, and take over his storage unit because he wasn't even able to pay for the rent on a storage unit. Mm -hmm. And so those type of things do give you the indicate, you know, some of the indicators of yep. somebody who's really struggling. His his brother disappeared from Ontario and has never been seen. He walked in, he walks off the face of the earth. And this is all taking place back at the time when Russell's in, you know, at Robbery Homicide Division. And he's involved in a in an affair. He's in trouble for allowing somebody to drive one of the department's vehicles. All these things are taking place. And when those things start to kind of collapse on you. You can lose your judgment. Okay. And I think that's all that happened. Uh, my last question for you, Greg. Thanks again. Um, the Fox special with us. Uh, uh, Solid, uh, I want to make sure I don't mess her name up. I see in uh, Solid Dad, Solid Dad, well, I'm, I'm messing her name up. But, um, you know, they had the Fox special about Biggie and Tupac. And mm -hmm. they interviewed Reggie. And Reggie looked like a little, little sweaty over there. You know what I mean? And then you, I guess, initially agreed to it. But then you declined afterwards. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So um, I had agreed to do it. Oh, and I absolutely want, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. wanted to do it. And then 
um, because I was involved in this other production, mm -hmm. right? Well, when you're involved in another production, you kind of sign over what's called exclusive rights. And so before, and so they're doing Unsolved, and now you've got this other project where they want to do this documentary about the murders, right? And yep. so I have to get clearance in order to go and do that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I talk to the producers over on that project. I go, listen, I'm waiting to hear back from my lawyer. I can't be interviewed today. Let me get back. So I get right back to them. I go, dude, it's been cleared. I'm good to go. Let's hook up. And they're like, okay, we will schedule you down the road. I have it all here in a text. I've saved this text. And I'll put this up too, um, where it's clearly me saying, hey man, I'm available. Let me know, let me know, let me know, let me know. And they're continuing to say, okay, we will, we will, we will. And then they never get a hold of me. And the whole thing is then presented as if I never showed up or if I declined. That's all bullshit. I declined one day because I had to get the clearance necessary for me to not work on Unsolved and then go work on a competing project. Okay. Because I had already signed an exclusive agreement not to go outside of that. It's just, it's just the legal technicalities. Okay, before we go, just for the record, are you willing to actually do anything with the dossier at all? You know, they coming out with a second season. You had a lot of info that you may or may not agree with. But at the end of the day, what are we here for? We're trying to solve who killed Biggie. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I appreciate that. the difference is up? I appreciate that. And again, I will, I will deal, I'd be happy to deal with this, but I want to deal with this in a way that we just deal with facts and evidence. Okay. And so I'm going to have a podcast. They're mm -hmm. always welcome to sit in. We can go through the documents and we're going to put them all up for the public so yep. that everybody has it right there because that's what you guys deserve. You guys deserve to hear the tapes. You deserve to see the documents. You deserve to see the videos. We're going to put it all out there. Mm -hmm. And then you get to be in the most informed position you can in order to make your own judgments and conclusions. Okay, absolutely. Uh, when does that podcast drop? You got a date yet? Or Dude, I'm being? waiting for this wall behind me. I'm waiting for this 55-inch Dell monitor that will allow me to, then to do it so that I can, you know, but I've built this beautiful podcast studio. I've got people helping me with the technical straight up, you know. And I'm also working on a couple other podcasts um, as we speak. So I'm trying to get it out there. I'm just waiting for things to fall into place. Okay. So, again, Greg, thanks thanks a lot for having this convo. You know, I got to hit you with the 60-minute the, the hard-hitting, hardball questions. You know what I mean? I appreciate you, man. So I honestly you. do. I appreciate you. And good luck with everything. Good luck with the continued success of your uh, radio station. All right, man. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yeah, good you got it. Right. Yep. Bye.